Are we trumpeting our horns a little bit too much, James, by saying that we have bona fide African multinationals? Not at all, Lerato. I think uh, the evidence is strong and visible that African companies are beginning to expand beyond their borders uh, into the rest of the region. Now, of course, many companies in South Africa and in North Africa had already reached that scale and, and, and yeah. expanded. What's interesting is that we're now seeing companies um, from the rest of sub-Saharan Africa really beginning to think bigger. And you see in countries like Nigeria, mm -hmm. countries like Kenya, Zimbabwe, elsewhere, yeah. uh, really thinking beyond their borders and seizing ad opportunities based on their comparative advantage. Yeah, and I mean, I can mention one from each region. You've mentioned Owando in uh, Nigeria, KCB in Kenya, Certainly. Um, Econet in Zimbabwe, MTN right here. Absolutely, um, and, th and the examples are numerous. Again, you know, um, whether you're looking at the energy sector where you know, you're seeing Africa's rising demand for energy really helping companies like Oando, like yeah. Kennel Cobble, yeah. um, like, uh, uh, like Gulf Energy, among others, really grow rapidly. If you look at access to finance, you see companies like you know, um, uh, Bank, uh, uh, United Bank of Africa and yeah. several others coming out of Nigeria, like Equity Bank, really driving yes. innovation yes. Uh, at the base of the pyramid. Um, you're starting to see that innovation really kick in mm. across the region. So how would you describe an African multinational then? I think in our, in our thinking, we're really looking at those companies that really trace their roots to an African country, but have made significant efforts to expand into markets beyond their home base. And this is important for a number of reasons. One is, of course, growth is always good. But frankly, the skills you need to really move beyond your home market mm. are the skills that distinguish a company that's really based on a few sets of local relationships mm. and, and unique local uh, situations from a real potential champion in the future. Now, before the credit crisis, we saw these so-called African champions uh, growing at an average of 30% uh, per annum and really outpacing their counterparts in the developed markets. How do they fare today, especially when you compare them to S&P 500 companies? Um, I think you see them continuing to outperform uh, on almost any measure. Uh, and that's not surprising because at the end of the day, somewhat surprisingly, Africa as a whole has weathered the crisis, the economic crisis, better than other regions. Uh, and you see this reflected in the way that the companies have grown. You also see the fact that there's a whole very latent and untapped market that they're going into. So regardless of which strategy they're pursuing, mm -hmm. they're finding a lot of open running room um, to expand and grow and sustain those growth rates right. that, uh, that are really in excess of 30%. You were quoted as saying once that uh, an African multinational must apply global growth and expansion strategies and then adapt them to local conditions. Indeed. Adaptation, what does that mean in Africa? Um, I think it's about recognizing the complexity of really expanding beyond um, a market that you know well into markets where um, a lot of the basic conditions are still evolving. So in many African countries, the, the main reason global multinationals have struggled uh, in coming into Africa or found it a less attractive market is some of the regulatory challenges, some of the, the challenges around predictability and so on. Um, if you are a company that's already got its roots in an African country, you have built, you've gotten to scale by just learning how to work with the, with, within those contexts. Now, when you think about going beyond your own borders, mm -hmm. you need to think about what don't I understand about the new market I'm going into? Mm -hmm. And more importantly, how do I get that understanding? Is there someone who can help me build that capability? Is there a local partner uh, that I may be able to work with? Um, I will add, I think the, the most critical insight that we noted from African multinationals was the amount of time they were willing to invest right. in entering each new country, recognizing that each new country was complex. Right. I mean, in jest, people always say Africa's not for sissies, but underlying is this idea that it's very difficult, as you've said, you've used the word complexity, doing business in Africa. Just talk us through some of those unique challenges and characteristics beyond regulatory issues. There's infrastructure, there's skills, there's relationship building that's really needed in Africa. People need to trust you Absolutely. in order for you to get ahead. Absolutely. Um, um, so much of what you need to succeed in, in many African markets is about um, a, a set of soft skills and, and soft capital, really. In addition to the concrete capabilities of your business, you really need to build a powerful network in the country that you're coming into. And part of the way you do that is either 
A, by really ramping out slowly, uh, ramping up slowly as you come into a market. So start with a product, really use that to learn the lay of the land and, and build out of that bridgehead into, into the country. Mm -hmm. Another alternative is finding a trustworthy partner. Now, you notice I put in trustworthy there. <laughs> um, many of the companies that we spoke to as part of this report emphasized just how crucial it was to find someone who shared their objectives, really understood their business, was bringing value to the table, yeah. and was, was there, for, there for, the, for the long haul. Something that I've recognized personally, you know, it's not yeah. based on empirical research, is 10 or so years ago, when you looked at Africa, studied the politics, the environment, the state was the nucleus of the economy. It mm -hmm. was an overarching state. You couldn't do business without a government relationship. Yeah. Fast forward 2011, and there's some kind of synergy between the private sector now working in tandem with the state. What's changed? I think a number of things have changed, and I think they've happened on both sides of that divide. I think we do need to recognize and give credit where credit is due in saying African governments have changed. And there is a greater awareness of the role of the private sector in really enabling growth and, frankly, a real commitment to delivering growth for their citizens in many countries. Um, so that's created an open door. And at the same time, you've seen African companies building the kinds of capabilities that make them a credible partner with government. Mm. Uh, and what we're seeing, and, and hopefully we're going to see more of, is a positive and constructive dialogue between the state and, and, and companies in an environment. So for example, a lot of the very constructive dialogue that's happened around regulations in the telecommunications and financial sectors, I'll take the example of mm. Kenya, has created an ecosystem where a lot of innovation is really cutting edge by global mm. standards. That doesn't happen purely because of government regulatory moves, nor does it happen purely because of private sector ingenuity. It comes from the two of them really getting around the table and figuring out what's a win-win for both sides of the table. Now we talk about these companies expanding into the rest of the subcontinent, mm -hmm. but we're also working in an environment that's increasingly globalized. And what many people are calling for are these African companies starting to penetrate markets outside the African continent in the way in which we're starting to see Chinese companies come into Africa, Brazilian companies, Indian companies do the same. We need to have that happening in the reciprocal um, uh, form. What is the impetus for African companies to go global, truly global? Um, I think the opportunity is, is, quite, is, is, is there, and it does exist. And, and I think the right analogy to use is thinking about um, evolution. So African companies are evolving in some very tough conditions. Tough conditions create tough players. Yeah. Um, the key in expanding beyond your local markets, though, is making sure you're focusing on that capability that you've created that is unique to you and compelling to you. And you do have a number of success stories. Nando's from here in South Africa, for example, <laughs> yeah. um, has managed to take their particular model and really build a global yeah. brand. Um, a few others are also trying to do the same. I think consistently what we've seen, though, is where African companies expand primarily by you know, using their checkbook they're at a disadvantage. They have less capital than competitors in other parts of the world, and they're entering markets they understand less well. However, those who are expanding based on an understanding of a unique competitive capability or a unique innovation that they're taking out right. there, they're in a slightly better right. position.